morning, lovely, lovely to see everybody, and especially to see Elizabeth with us uh, again. Let's pray. Lord, open your word to us that in faith we may walk in your way. Amen. One Wednesday afternoon in the autumn of 1971, I attended a seminar in the Sheffield University Students' Union on the subject of what was then called third world development. Several speakers argued passionately and persuasively for justice between the nations, between the uh, halves of the global north and the have-nots of the global south. I remember one speaker saying that what the people in Tanzania most needed in order to develop their economy and uh, reduce their dependence on the rich and powerful nations was to build coal-fired power stations and cement works. I could understand why he was saying this, but it troubled me for this reason. Over the previous one or two years, I'd become increasingly interested in issues of ecology and the environment, in um, pollution and the misuse of resources. And so it seemed to me that to encourage more and more heavily uh, in a polluting industrialization would have very negative effects on the environment. I remember walking back to my hall of residence, pondering on what seemed to be an irreconcilable tension between what was good for planet Earth and what was good for its inhabitants. A thought came into my mind, almost a cry of despair. God, if you really are out there, oh boy, do we need your help to sort out the mess that this world is in. That same evening, there was a knock on my door. I opened it to find someone from along the corridor saying to me, the Christian Union's having a book week. Would you be interested to buy this book, Basic Christianity, that explains uh, about what uh, the Christian faith is all about? I bought it. Um, and I'll leave the rest of the story for another time, but suffice it to say that the coincidence between my cry for help being followed hardly three hours later by a potential answer made a distinct impression upon me. Now, the title of this sermon is a question, which way? And it's based upon both Isaiah chapter 35 that um, Helen read to us, but also on chapter 34, which we didn't read, but it, do please open your Bible, it's on page 719, and if you don't have one, it would be quite helpful, so if there's anybody that would like to, um, I'm sure Jan could pick one, um, give one out to you. So we need to look at chapter 34, and that's subtitled, um, uh, Judgment Against the Nations. Now, judgment, uh, uh, chapter 35 was subtitled, The Joy of the Redeemed. And that, as we've heard, is a prophecy about blossoming, blossoming of the desert and the return of God's people to the promised land. It was full of new life, new color, new joy, new singing, new strength, new courage. And it speaks of creation and of exodus and of returning home and the, of the promise of God returning to his people and establishing his kingdom. What's not to like about that picture? Chapter 34, we need to hold together with chapter 35 in order for us to see how uh, this question of which way uh, relates. But first, let's just remind ourselves of what from where it is that justice comes. 
Last week, we were looking at chapter 35 and we were at chapter 33. Uh, and the verse that we started with at the beginning of this service was chapter 33, verse 6. But the previous verse, verse 5, says that the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. Justice is from God. Now, at the beginning of chapter 34, then, Isaiah announces that the Lord is speaking to the nations and their peoples, to the whole earth and to all that is in it. So in verse 2, we see the Lord is angry with all nations and he will totally destroy them. We're not told what specific things have angered God. Perhaps following on from what we've heard in previous weeks, it's the general sin of putting their trust in human policies rather than in God's promises. The Lord's wrath is on all their armies. Still in verse 2. And then the language in the next 15 verses is uncompromising. <coughs> Slaughter. The stench of death, blood. In verses 5 to 10, it's Edom in particular that is singled out as being the object of God's wrath. Edom was the land to the east and the south of the Dead Sea. And one of its principal cities was Bosra, which is mentioned in verse 6. But Edom was also the other name of Jacob. Um, oh, for, not for Jacob, but the other name for Jacob's brother, Esau, from whom the Edomites were descended. There'd been a long history of enmity between the Israelites and the Edomites. The Israelites had been instructed back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, 23, verse 7, not to despise the Edomites, but it seems that the Edomites persecuted the people of Judah. The little book of Obadiah is a prophecy against Edom. But it's verse 15 says the day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, so it will be done to you. And the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 12, verse 16, uses Esau or Edom as an example of profane godless behaviour that Christians should avoid. Perhaps then, in Isaiah 34, Edom's being held up as an illustration of what may happen or what will happen to any nation that acts in opposition to God and as an adversary to God's people. Let me read a few verses from chapter 34, starting from verse 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution, to uphold Zion's cause. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulphur. Her land will become blazing pitch. It will not be quenched day or night. Its smoke will rise forever. From generation to generation, it will lie desolate. No one will ever pass through it again. The desert owl and screech owl will possess it. The great owl and the raven will nest there. God will stretch out over Edom the measuring line of chaos and the plumb line of desolation. Her nobles will have nothing there to be called a kingdom. All her princes will vanish away. Graphic language, which may provide an image of hell, as some commentators suggest. Certainly Edom's downfall is final and complete. We are all ultimately answerable to God, who judges justly. Condemnation for the wicked, acquittal for the innocent. <coughs> But let's look more closely at the second half of that verse 11. 
God will stretch out over Eden the measuring line of chaos and the plumb line of desolation. The words translated as chaos and desolation are in Hebrew, tohu and bohu. Being a bit facetious, it sounds a bit like a child's game when peekaboo or something like that. Tohu and bohu, not only do they rhyme, but they are the same words that occur in Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was formless, tohu, and empty, bohu. Some commentators suggest that Isaiah is foretelling the undoing of the work of creation, the total destruction of the universe. They speak of birds and animals taking possession of the places that were previously occupied by humans upon whom God's wrath has justly fallen. The devastation wrought by God is not of the whole created order, but only on part of it, upon godless human civilization and society. One might say that the ecological balance is shifted in favour of non-human creation, and that this is a warning against the assumption that it's only human interests that matter to our creator God. Look at verses 16 and 17 at the end of chapter 34. Look in the scroll of the Lord and read, none of these, that is the birds and the animals, will be missing, not one will lack her mate. For it's God's mouth that has given the order, and his spirit will gather them together. He allots their portions. His hand distributes them by measure. They, again, the birds and the animals, will possess it forever and dwell there from generation to generation. Is there even a reminder here of the account in Genesis chapter 6 to 9 of Noah and the flood, that the ark saved not only Noah's family, but also the animals, each with its mate. Allow me, please, to read a passage from Tom Wright's very helpful book, Simply Good News, which is subtitled, Why the Gospel is News and What Makes It Good. I commend it. He writes, The wrath of God is the result of humans distorting his good creation, including human nature. The wrath of God is simply the shadow side of the love of God for his wonderful creation and his amazing human creatures. Like a great artist appalled at the way his paintings have been defaced by the very people who were supposed to be looking after them, God's implacable rejection of Evil is the natural outflowing of his creative love. God's anger against evil is itself the determination to put things right, to get rid of the corrupt attitudes and behaviours that have spoiled the world and it's his human create creatures. It is because God loves the glorious world he has made and is utterly determined to put everything right, that he is utterly opposed to everything that spoils or destroys that creation, especially the human creatures who were supposed to be the linchpins of his plan for how that creation would flourish. So then, Isaiah 34 tells us starkly 
that the pattern of godless living exemplified by Eden, but present in all the nations, leads to death and destruction for human society. In a moment, let's relish the magnificence of Isaiah chapter 35, which tells us of the way that leads to life. But first, there's one more comment I think that needs to be made. I wrote the first draft of this sermon a week ago, but since then we've seen the awful destruction and death caused by Monday's earthquake in Turkey, in Syria. Many people ask, where is God in this? Is God responsible for modern day natural disasters? We should note that the world we live in is not a static system in which natural processes operate according to a fixed predetermined pattern, but one that responds to a complex range of variables. The cycle of death and decay is necessary for life and the processes that give rise to natural disasters are often essential to the functioning of planet Earth within God's caring providence. There are indeed natural rhythms of sowing and harvesting, of birth and death, but it's also true that human actions in one sphere can have far-reaching and often devastating effects in another. The message of Isaiah and of other Old Testament prophets is not only one of doom and judgment, but of restoration to those who turn back to God. A vision of the world in which relationships are put right between people and God, within human society and in the wider creation. Chapter 35, verse 1. The desert and the par parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. The environmental catastrophe of chapter 34, verses 9 and 10, will be reversed. Be strong. Do not fear, verse 4. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy, verses 5 and 6. Jesus quoted these verses in reply to John the Baptist's question, are you the Messiah? That we heard in our New Testament reading. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus healed the man born blind and mute, Matthew 12, verse 22. And the name of Jesus enabled Peter to heal the man lame from birth. That's chapter 3. Jesus is the one who gives living water. Verses 6 and 7 from Isaiah 35. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool. The thirsty ground bubbling springs. Jesus said, I am the way. Verse 8, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. Only the redeemed will walk there and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I started this sermon by telling you about my cry more than 50 years ago for God's help to sort out the mess that the world seemed to be in, not least in the apparent conflict between the needs of the human and the non-human world. I've since come to realise that there is another way if we trust in God, who in Christ has come to redeem his people, calling us to walk in the way of holiness, then there is no conflict between what's good for planet Earth and what's good for its inhabitants. 
I've also come to recognize that the gospel is not just about saving souls. It's good news about saving people for life in God's glorious kingdom, in which his justice benefits both human society and the whole of his renewed creation. As we walk now by faith in the way of Christ, our proclamation of this good news should involve not only words, as important as they are, but also actions that show God's love for the whole of creation. The question each one of us must answer is this, which way should I go? The way that leads to death? Or the way that leads to life? Life in all its fullness, eternal life. Let's choose life. Thank <laughs> you.